Hey there, Bob from Morgan's Constant Gardener. So, we had our Green Room Live with Mariah from Evergreen Grower Supply today, and we did a Facebook Live. It was pretty, uh, that was our first one, but it was pretty successful. Everyone seemed to like it, but the volume was a little low. Kind of hard for some people to hear, maybe they were on their phones or something. But good news, we also videotape on this amazing cool camera here, which has a real good microphone on it, so you can hear really good with this. Unfortunately, this microphone only works if you turn it on which I neglected to do. So the video off this, no sound whatsoever. So what I've done is I took the Facebook Live video, ran it through the old video thing and bumped those levels up. It's a little blurry, not perfect sound, but you should be able to hear it. Should get the point across. That's what's coming up. Sorry, I'll do better next time. With this group, really wonderful people here. Um, what I want to do now is introduce our speaker to you. And I want to say again, thank you everyone for signing up and getting your places in here as you can see we're almost going to be running out of seats pretty soon so if you're interested in the next topic make sure you sign up right away for us um, and if you fill out a survey and put it in the box here uh, we'll be pulling out names to win something on a monthly basis so that'd be good for you to do as well so I am uh, honored to introduce Mariah LaChapelle she's an agronomist and works with Evergreen Grower Supply uh, she's a licensed pesticide consultant that specializes in biological control of insects and biopesticides uh, for Evergreen Grower Supply. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from Western Oregon University and a background uh, and is a professional viticulture certificate from Washington State University. She has a background in ornamental horticulture, greenhouse production, and uh, working with grapes, as I said before. Uh, she's got some great pictures to show you, too. Uh, she was previously employed at Fisher Farms as the plant health manager, and most of her work at Fisher Farms involves scouting the ornamental plants and making re recommendations for the release of certain uh, beneficial insects to help produce uh, long-term solutions for the pests and plant pathogens. Uh, let's give it up. I didn't, I, next time I'll shorten our bio a bit. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to. Three sentences next time, I promise. So, yeah, I'm here to talk about biological control of, pet, of basically pests and then biopesticides too. And I, I wanted to start by showing you guys actually one of the tools that I use, and I thought we could pass it around as we're talking. This is my hand lens, and I live with it uh, every day. And I use that for scouting, and I think it's a very important tool. You don't have to get anything fancy. So. What power is it? That's, I think, a 30X. I bought it on Amazon. So, you know, it's just one of those important tools. So, as she mentioned, I said how I learned to love the good bugs. Basically, my career started in ornamental horticulture. In an ornamental horticulture, they use all kinds of conventional insecticides and fungicides. And I worked at Monrovia Nursery, and that was where I was introduced to predatory mites, and I actually purchased my predatory mites from Evergreen Grower Supply. <coughs> so my real focus has always been trying to figure out what is the most effective way to control a pest with the least amount of impact on the environment. And what everything it always came back to was it was beneficial insects or the correct insecticide <coughs> at the right time. And then also I worked in vineyards too. And my focus there was the same. They have their, their pest mite problems too and I'm still active in the wine industry as well. Oh, and a few other things. I, I, if we have any questions that are kind of off topic but we want to focus on later, I just put it in a little parking lot here. So, do you guys have anything that comes to mind? You want to blurt it out? We can put it here. And then there's a few other concepts that are a little off topic, off topic, but relevant too. And so, we'll start with how what it's defined as. What is biological control? And it's the use of an organism to reduce the population density of another organism. So you can look at it like introducing a soldier on a battlefield. You know, you're, 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 if you have a problem, you have an organism to go after it. And this picture here is uh, Aphidius pulmoni, and what he's doing is he's ovipositing inside an aphid, Lay, or she, I should say, laying an egg inside the aphid. And what, what happens? 
Uh, what's that? What is that thing called? Uh, Aphidius colmani. And they're just, they come in these little vials. And what you do is you release them and they go after aphids. So they don't, they lay their egg inside the aphid. And what you'll see are these little brown mummies. So instead of an aphid, what happens is the egg develops. It's a parasitic relationship. So that the egg develops and becomes a wasp. It's a predatory wasp. What happens to ladybug if ladybug eats that? Do they chew them good enough to break the, the egg? Um, yeah. Okay. And if, we'll talk about, where did that my pen go? I'll write ladybug down because I think ladybug is a good one. Because that is an important one for evergreen because we don't sell ladybugs anymore for a few reasons. So, and so basically what you get is another beneficial insect instead of an aphid. And you'll see a tiny hole in the aphid if you look at it with the hand lens where the predatory wasp has come out. Yeah. And then I think one of the major reasons why people are here for this discussion is the, what we call the micro mites, which are mites that are so small, they generally cause damage to the crop before you notice them. And broad mites is one of them. And this photo actually came from the Department of Agriculture Entomology. So, and you guys, anybody can do this, is you can go to the Department of Agriculture, reach out to the entomologist, his name is Josh Blatch, and he will inspect plants for you. And this was, this is a, you can't see it very well, but this is the, a female broad mite right down here. Yeah, and then these right here are the eggs. And the, the difference between a broad mite and a cyclamen mite is the broad mite eggs have those little nubby things on them. So, but the same thing, they're minuscule mites that cause all kinds of damage, basically. What's that magnification you're using? Oh, probably over 100. Uh, what was the magnification of the jeweler's loop you're talking about? 30x. So if you go online, it's a jeweler's, <coughs> jeweler's loop. Okay. It's somewhere around 20 bucks. Hobby Lobby. Yeah, there you go. And the lapidary supply. Yeah. If you don't want to give your money to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> Yeah, so, I think they sell loops here as well. Oh, they do? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, different, different magnifications. Uh -huh. and one, yeah. that, one that attaches to your, your camera. Perfect. So you can take a photo. Yeah. Yeah. Was it 60? 60 times. 60 times. Oh, 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 with your yeah, and a 60x yeah. hand lens so, is, so, is so, what so, you should be able to see. Now, broad, 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 broad mics require higher magnification, and that is honestly where. Um, Getting a good entomologist to give you feedback is vital because, as you guys know, the problem with broad mites is their saliva is toxic. So, what you get is you get the leaf curling. Yeah, you get the leaf curling, and that's how you you find the pest is present. Or you have a uh, you you develop a scouting program where you're always looking at the leaves with magnification, at least on a weekly basis. Yeah. So, how many of you guys have used beneficial insects? Good. Yeah. And which ones do you use for broad mites? Scorpions. Mm -hmm. Californicus. Mm -hmm. and okay. So, Californicus is actually what I usually prescribe for him for us at night. And Swirsky is a good predator, but it requires white fly to reproduce. So you're buying you're buying a predator that won't be staying on the crop. So what we sell instead is Amblycia sandersoni, also comes from Europe, but a more effective predator because it will stick with your crop. Cucumaris, which is also a predator, manufactured it, it's uh, real in the U.S. too. So if you're conscious of where the bugs are coming from, and it's actually Cost effect, more cost effective cucumeris is. What kind of um, fluctuation can they handle in like different humidities? So, I think that cucumeris likes low humidity. Okay. But when we're talking about humidity, we're talking about what's going on, on the surface of a leaf. It's different than the relative humidity of a room. Okay. That's why I think that bringing in a, a, a few different types of predators and seeing what works in your growing environment is a much better way to go. 
Um, I know that you are, or at least I've seen offers a uh, certain spray that uh, uses a uh, type of fungus, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh -huh. and it's the same as the PFR 97. Uh -huh. How do you feel about spraying uh, that on your crop with these kind of insects? So biopesticides like that one, Isaria is the active ingredient, mm -hmm. is most predators will survive in the presence of those spores. They will? Yes. Or they might reduce the population, but generally they're relatively compatible. So it's because a broader spectrum insecticides, like pyrethrin, oil, anything that you're using to knock down the population, you need to reintroduce. But I always put caveats out there, as much as there, there is with the claims, you're always going to affect your biocontrol when you do a spray. So you're saying it's not necessarily one species of mite, but more of a pull from yeah. populations to control problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, 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 you know, people like Swirsky a lot, and maybe it has to do with the fluctuations in humidity, maybe they do well there. But if they're not going to be able to reproduce on your crop, then it's kind of a tough call. And I'll, and this is a gen this predatory mite called Pelasis is a gen is a good generalist predator. Generalist means that it'll kind of eat whatever's in front of it, and it likes 50% relative humidity. So if I were to put out something at the beginning of the growing season, uh, just just a general do this for better health. What would that be? This guy, Pelasis. Pelasis. Okay. Yeah. And it can survive a lower humidity than the others or reproduce at a lower Well, 50% is what it, what it does. And that's another conversation that we can have, too, because your growing room environments vary, and if you're growing outdoors, then lower humidity. And there's other guys out there. There's a guy called Longipiece, and he does well in varying humidity. Uh, I think I'm going to mispronounce this, but uh, hypoasis? Yeah, hypoaspis, and don't, don't worry about it, because the other word for it is stradiolalaps. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can win. It's Latin, and the taxonomist decided to change it to stradiolalaps. Um, can yeah. you comment on your usage of that predatory? I love it, and we were talking about this in the store earlier. You can introduce hypoaspis to your cuttings, and it will survive throughout the entire life cycle of the plant. So, and because it's also a generalist predator that lives in the soil, it reduces your pest populations in general, including your fluorescent mite. And you can do foliar applications with insecticides and the hypoaspis will live there. Would you recommend one application, multiple applications? One application to your babies. Babies. Or if you have a big problem. So find you, you find you introduce the hypoaspis early, but yet you have some high populations here or here and there you can spot treat. Mm -hmm. We call them hypos, by the way, to make your life easier. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a way you can encourage that population to, let's say if you're trying to inoculate a field or a small pot, um, encourage that population to maintain? Well, because they're naturally occurring, really they like organic matter. But the problem with organic matter is that you end up with other pathogens and things like that too. <laughs> so when, when we use hypos, it's like buying insurance, you know that they're present. And they're cost effective, and a liter can treat up to 2,000 square feet. And then we have these five liter line bags and can treat up to 10,000 square feet. Yes. Yeah, so it's a great way to basically buy a little bit of insurance for your pests, preventing pests. And then I, I decided to put compatible in quotes, because like we were talking about, anything, nothing is truly compatible, we just do our best. And how many of you guys have applied Grandivo? Yeah, yeah. And it's it's this is a, a Chromobacterium is what it's called, and it is heat killed, and it's a stomach toxin for the mites. So on the surface of the leaf, you, you apply the the Grandivo at a tablespoon per gallon, but it takes ten days for a mite to digest it. So an insect life cycle. Is more is is pretty short, so you just got to take that into account. There's really no silver bullet, but this could help you program too. And then, uh, and is that compatible with? Or that is compatible. With yeah, relatively, but it's a stomach toxin. So if there's a little bit of residue on on a on a pest, I don't know. It could affect them to some extent. What what they do is some EPA registered. Pesticides in general will do studies where they'll subject a, 
beneficial to the toxin, see where if it'll survive or not. So you can kind of dig into the information and see. And none of this will affect any testing, correct? Well, Red Eagle's not on the not not on the the list for the OHA, so you're okay there. Pyganic, as you know, pyrethrin. You got to be careful about timing, because even I've I've worked with growers that have used pyganic at the label rate and a few you know weeks before harvest, and they still got 1.13 parts per million, so just above. So it's a tough one, but preferol isaria. Another one that, that they're not that, that won't come up because it's a biopesticide. Um, I first learned about you from your Instagram feed. Mm -hmm. um, one of the photos that you recently posted, uh, which was from a person named Andre Mendez uh, with a magnified shot, uh -huh. I followed, started following him also. And he yeah. seems to be a big believer in, or she, I'm not really sure, yeah. big believer in magnified sulfur. Yeah. And I know that's, you know, kind of kills everything yeah. for sure. What are your thoughts about that? I think that we talked about micronized sulfur. So the approved list for the Department of Agriculture, this. So, um, and also it, what the, the mode of action for, for sulfur is that it becomes a gas, right? So it, so it gases the bugs. It works well for hemprescent mite. It doesn't work well for everything. And then compliance is very important to me. So you got to use the right product. And then in, in that in that case, they had a hemp recipe my infestation, and they applied sulfur. But you know, it's I think sometimes people kind of treat things like hot sauce, where it works for one thing, so they put it everywhere. And so I think that you got to be focused about your application. So the correct application of sulfur to reduce hemp recipe my populations, and then a beneficial insect release would be a good way to go. Because it's that compliance thing. It's tricky, but I want to give the right advice, too, you know? Yeah. Any questions so far? I think I heard you talking about a two-week interval between applying oh, the right. sulfur and applying your, your pet beneficial. That's another thing. Okay. Well, so sulfur and oil, they don't like each other at all. So if you have applied anything with oil, including neem, uh, you need to make sure that you don't have don't apply sulfur because it'll curl the leaves. Do you, does that still hold true with uh, essential oils? As well? Yeah. Okay. Anything that's got oil in it. And how long would you wait, or would you like spray your plants with water before doing that? I would wait two weeks. Two weeks. And this comes from the vineyard okay. folk who time their sulfur application and their oil application. So, yeah. And then the last one that we touched on, the preferol, Isaria, it's, it's another thing. Stepping back a little bit, all the, the it's some of these biopesticides, yeah? Real quick, um, how far into flower did you apply the sulfur? You gotta be careful about that too, for extract and for two weeks into this flower, and then shut it off maybe? Yeah, but again, the, you know, the approved application of the correct one and all that, but yeah, two weeks. Where was I going? Oh, mycoinsecticides. So they're fungal spores that grow inside of insects. So that's what preferol is. And then you guys might be familiar with MET52. Has anybody used MET52 in here? And it's coming back in February if you like it. Same thing though. It's a fungal spore that grows inside insects. It's kind of a, a strange thing that biology does sometimes, but it works for root aphids. Mm -hmm. What kind of aphids? Root aphids. Root aphids. Okay. Which that's another one I think I'm going to put in the parking lot for later because we have a diagnose uh, 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 taxonomy of root aphids figured out now too. Or I should say identification. So the broad mite. Going back to broad mites. A lot of people when they get their their leaves distorted, they think broad mites, but it's there's different factors to why your leaves can curl, right? You can get high salts, pH imbalance, herbicide phytotoxicity. Anybody familiar with what happens to manure sometimes? So, hay that's been treated with a certain type of herbicide, the cows consume it, and then the cows excrete it. Inside that manure is herbicide residue. And so you get the leaf curling, 
So I think when, you, when you're looking at your soil, it's important to look at where the manure came from or where the excrement in general came from. You know, I think that some, some companies only use chicken manure for just that reason because they've seen it before in the nursery industry, for example. Is there a life on it? How long is it? You know, I have to look into that one. It, it's, it depends on if it was applied properly. One cheap way that you can test for herbicide phytotoxicity in your plants is to plant a tomato seed inside the container. If the leaves curl just like the plant curls, then you know that you have herbicide residue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Jumping back to sulfur. Uh huh. Um, we did a thing called Coastal Bed PF. Yep. That brand? Yep. Is that all right? Well, the, the, the vineyards use it. Okay. It's, it's micronized sulfur again. It's sulfur that you add to water. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Just wanted to check. But it's this one, right? Uh, yeah. Now it is. Now it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first part, the broad mites. And then. The magnification, to, this is probably not, you're not going to be able to see broad mites most likely with this, but in general, you need to be careful with the leaves. And if anybody's interested afterwards, you can email me. My card's up there, and I can give you information on how to talk to the Department of Ag for ID. And then, where did your plants come from? Did he have broad mites? And all, if you brought in plants from your buddy, maybe look at them. Two, you know. What what would you recommend to do for um, um, I can't do the word for uh, keeping plants away from the animals? You know, like um, quarantine. Quarantine. You. Oh. quarantine. Well, maybe a part of the, the wherever your growing environment is completely separate from where your plants are, and also where foot traffic can be the most limited too. You know, when I worked at the nursery, whenever we brought in cuttings, they always gave me a call. I looked at them, and they didn't go anywhere else until we made sure they didn't have any. Anyway, any I was looking at the tent just with that in mind. Yeah, for sure, because then you can isolate. Yeah, and then you have a quarantine area. And when you're inspecting your plants, which where do you want to focus? Um, well, if it's if it's broad mites, you're going to look at the, very closely at the leaves and stems, and the new tissue. It depends on the pest. Underside as well as top side. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this goes on to hemprescent mite. This is a scanning electron micrograph of hemprescent mite. Nasty, huh? Mm. Yeah. And they, what I tell people is, you can see these with the hand lens, and they look like golden cigars, like little tiny golden cigars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know they're nasty. It's a, it's a, it's a nasty pest. And another thing too, people say that that um, it was intentionally uh, introduced by the government. Uh, the genus and species of hemprescent mites is Aculops cannabicola. And cannabicola means that it, it's genus specific. It only likes cannabis. So, so that whole yeah. introduced by the government thing, not true. <laughs> it's not a conspiracy theory. Unfortunately, it's just a genus specific, just like there's tomato russet black mite. Is all this cold weather enough to kill ones that are lingering? We can hope. Because they're going to go down to the soil. So yeah. when, when, a, when a host isn't present, they'll be down in the soil. Okay. And the cold temperatures will reduce the pressure. Pressure is the likelihood of it. We uncovered all the beds oh, yeah. just in case, but... Well, and, introduce, and you can actually introduce that hypoaspis any time of year. Any time of year? Yeah. Okay, I was going to have to do that. Yeah. What's that? Can you put it in the soil? Yeah. yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. So we'll move on from this ugly guy. Yeah. 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 What is the word that you use for that when they keep them dormant in the soil and wait until they come? One word is diapause. Yeah. So in the, so in life cycle, all the reproduction occurs on the leaves. So the egg laying occurs on the leaves. The females lay eggs on the leaves. And the underside generally. And they, they have multiple generations per year. That's one of the challenges of hemp russet mite is the fact that there's 
if they reproduce so much, it's hard to get the populations under control. And like I mentioned, they, they, they occur in all kinds of other crops too. If you go to an extension page and look up areified mites and tomatoes, you know there's two active ingredients. Abum abid and <coughs> is what's typically used for mites, areified mites. But I think I'm glad this is an opportunity for us. We don't have to use the toxic stuff. We have, we have another option too, which is the beneficial insects. And as we mentioned with the soil treatment, uh, the uh, they go down to the soil and they don't have a host to live on. How deep are you talking in the soil? Oh, the surface. They're not going to go. They're not going to bur burrow downward like a, a, a beetle would. They're just going to be at the top. And as we talked about the biocontrol options, Andersoni, Thalassus, Stratodilaps, Stratodilaps, Hycoaspis, and Cucumaris. And the approved pesticides at the, at the time I made this slide. Grandivo, pyrethrin. Isaria preferol is labeled for mites. So you can use that. Botanic garden, my control, but actually that I need to take that one off. These two work better for aphids and thrips. Not so much impressive. But if you need to add something to your rotation, you could add that too. And so it's likely that beneficial can live with Grandivo, residue, Piganic, probably not, Botanigard, maybe. And how many of you guys use neem? What do you what do you typically use neem for? Cucumber beetles and um, squash bugs. Okay, that's that's a good use. Mostly for powdery mildew prevention. Okay, okay. So neem doesn't work very well on powdery mildew. Because what works, what what makes the powdery mildew, what, what the active ingredient neem, or the mode of action there is the oil that's in neem. So neem itself, the astaractin, is an insect growth regulator. So it prevents the insect from reproducing. So when you have powdery mildew, you could also use a Hortland oil product. In general, like we were talking about this one, because that that not so. But in general, like a mineral oil is fine. Or like sesame or something. Yeah. Okay. I know this is kind of getting off topic. How do you feel about regalia for cardio? Oh yeah, regalia, we can talk about that. We can do PM. If you guys have time, we can talk about powdery mildew too. So I'll put a number. And I think that actually is the last slide. I'm curious what you would use to treat the space, tools, Oh, walls, okay, yeah, so zero tall. So hydrogen peroxide, but zero tall is the product that a lot of growers are using right now. You guys use zero tall? Yeah, so the, the label on zero tall has a section for surfaces and pots and all that. I like it because it's a stable hydrogen peroxide, so you know that it's working. Uh, on your website, you talk a little bit about uh, bush beans. Uh -huh. um, is there a specific type of bird soybean very good one? Um, in Georgia, what, what do you think? Uh, I think any bean. Strike is the one that, that um, works well, and it, I think it has to do with the leaf structure. And when they're talking about green beans, we're talking about scouting. So a two-spot spider mite is going to go to a green bean before it's going to go to your plant. So you can, yeah, so in the springtime or whatever, you can put a green bean seed in a four inch pot and put it inside your your plant. Yeah. And then look at that. It's got all the runner beans too? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, any of them. Yeah, because the, the, it's a preferential host. And, and so, do you think raw mites would also go, or the compressed mite result would also go to that and you can kind of destroy it, or? Mm, it's more for two spotted spider mites. Okay, so it's like a scouting yeah. sort of technique. Yeah. And if we, we had, you know, a tracking course with beans, would it be better to be treating the beans 
or just ripping them out at a certain point? I just, just after you after they've served their purpose, you can toss them. Mm -hmm. You said you broke that seed, right? What's that? You said grow the uh, bean by seed. Yeah, make sure it's organic. I made that mistake once where I put, I did a bunch of scouting plants, and then I, everything that landed on it was dead. <laughs> What are some other scouting plants? Huh? What are some other scouting plants? Um, yeah, the green bean is the most common one. But that's only for the two spot. Yeah, for the two spot spider Yeah. So really, but it will. It, other pests will be attracted to it too. And that's actually a, another discussion I'd like to have with you guys later is, is banker plants, plants that encourage beneficials too, because I think that's important. I was going to ask about marigolds and uh, marigolds and sunflowers and things like that that attract yeah, beneficials. Well, you know, beneficials like pollen. Mm -hmm. That's their, their food. So any, anything that, that produces a fair amount of po pollen, there's this beautiful plant called Phacelia. P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A, -E and Phacelia in general, uh, beneficial insects like a lot. And you said that was P-H-A-C-L-I-A? P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A. They use it for cover crops and things like that, so in the outdoor environment if you want to increase your... So I use a lot of traps for cucumber beetles, uh -huh. especially oh, yeah. I believe with, with clove oil. Uh -huh. But we started with a little bit of mold using a product from here that had rose geranium oil in it. Mm -hmm. And we ended up with bungee jumpers, you know, little worms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if that rose oil attracts, <laughs> is it a uh, moth? Oh, sure, there's pheromones. pheromones. Is, it, is that, does that rose oil attract things I don't want? Uh, it could be. It, it's like Brits love the smell of, of roses. Yeah. So you can't. Sometimes you don't win, right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. This is a friend of mine here. Come on in. Have a seat. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of uh, cucumber beetles, but we didn't do anything to combat them this uh, growing season. What? What did they do? Cucumber beetles? Yes. They see, they they feed on the leaves. Yeah, we saw a lot of them. Yeah. And that same thing for me for greenhouse growers. They get the cucumber beetle. They transmit a lot of diseases yeah. there. We wouldn't have a garden. Yeah. Trapping. Well, and it's tough because with cucumber beetle, generally what you need to use something relatively for an insecticide, something effective because they're a beetle, so it's strong. So. What's something that you would recommend for that? You could try Grand Evo. For the cucumber beetle. Yeah, you could try it. Sticky traps were done. <laughs> Dipo. So, the so 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 cucumber beetles is what we're talking about. Meaties. And uh, we, we always resorted to heavy chemistries at, yeah. the, at the nursery. Yeah. I don't work there anymore. I don't do that stuff yeah. anymore. Yeah. I'm clean. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so when I would be walking in a greenhouse, like you, you see this biomass here? This is a whole lot of plant, right? Yeah, it's a lot of plant. And so. A, a little bit of cucumber beetle, it's going to survive. Survive more than if you had used something broad spectrum, right? Which is going to kill all the other beneficials anyway. And then you get back on that chemical train anyway. We noticed, we noticed a lot of um, moth larvae. Yeah. Cabbage moths. Yeah. What would you suggest for that besides the BT or something? Trick a grandma. Okay. So there's this this like that wasp I was telling you about, the Aphidius colmani. So Trichogramma is a parasitic wasp. Can you spell that? T R I C H O G R A M M A. Yes. And there are different types of Trichogramma for different, and it's based on the crop level. So some Trichogramma species go up, up, up. It can't be. So for cutworm, for example, I think it's platinari, right? Anyway, so it depends on how high the plant's going. Okay. So you do it, and you can do a dipel application and do do a release of the trichogramma. So if you think back to when you had moth problems, you can time your trichogramma with it. <coughs> well, the trichogramma go after the larvae while they're still. In I believe they go after the eggs. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So. It, and you know you're gonna to have to bear in mind you're gonna do more than one application to release a trichogramma. So some some beneficial insects to get efficacy you have to build up their populations, but they're they're very cost effective. They're the world's smallest wasp, predatory wasp. Oh, I 
So you can't see them very well. Will they stay? You can't sting this or anything, right? No. <laughs> and uh, what time in the early spring can you release them? When the temperatures are just warm enough for them to survive, essentially, and ahead of your moth infestation. So you look back on that calendar maybe and say, when did I have that moth problem? We should probably get some trichogramma. Or the first time you see white fluttering over the over your field. Yeah. Is there anything really effective for trapping cabbage moths or any of the other moths? Not so far that I know of. Maybe a reme. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, yeah. covers. So talk about that. Reme on those guys is not. Yeah. yeah. So you guys want to go back to the parking lot now, or did you have any other questions? Yeah? So ladybugs, we, we can start with ladybugs. So ladybugs are always harvested in the wild. And they also send vector viruses to other ladybugs. And so we, we no longer sell them because we call them the gateway drug to biocontrol, you know, because you can see them. <laughs> so when you're releasing, you know you have some beneficial insects out there. But the, the efficacy and also the, the fact that this organism isn't reared in an environment and is possibly vectoring viruses to other ladybugs is it's just not. But we sell lacewing. That could be your replacement. Green lacewing. We had some problems with our lacewing because we have a pretty big hornet population. Uh -huh. Would the trichodrama and lacewig be okay to work together like a wasp species going after the, the lacewig? Because uh, when we got the lacewig, they were in a form and they were hatching, but they didn't get to because the wasps were all over. Well, well, the trichodrama doesn't parasitize lacewing larvae, yeah. right? No. They shouldn't even have any interaction. Yeah. Okay. So they're compatible. Okay, so in the lace wing is an adult form, they're not predatory. They don't go after anything once they're they're just there to fly around in the eggs. And they're right. pretty. Yeah. 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 They're awesome. Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen lace wing before? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're real long. They're they're green is what we sell. They're bright green color and they their wings do look like lace. So I have, I have a question actually. Uh -huh. Does anyone sell brown lace wing? Not in the state because the ODA doesn't approve it. Is that why? Yeah. Because they're everywhere and, and yeah. they're actually, I like them better because yeah. they're predatory at every stage. Right. And I do get requests from people for brown lace wing, but I think it has to do with the import export rules. So. And the, the bug lights that they sold, the nighttime bug lights, lace wings love them. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> discussions about that. Yeah, it's tough because we talk about that in greenhouses sometimes where if you have a winged insect issue, then those bug zappers work, but they're broad spectrum too. So, and how many of you guys have had to deal with root aphids here? Yeah? What have you used? Uh, Met 52. Met 52? Okay. Well, Met 52, as we talked about, is going to be back on the market in February. The metarizium and sophila that might go pesticide. But then uh, Botanicar WP or Bovaria in general. I say botanic the WP because it's a powder, so it's less likely to affect the roots of the of the plant, basically. So root gent drenches. And I have a tech document I can send anybody that needs my email address, I can send you the tech document because there are some rates and things that rotations, things like that that help is a good useful tool. And strat and hypos, hypoaspis. What does a root aphid look, look like uh, it, to your plants? I have a picture on my phone. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick for you. I think it was recent enough. Um, I think mostly a hydroponic. Well, they, it's an interesting one. It's all the pictures I see and it's been on. Yeah. Let me see if I can get to where I can. I'll show it to you if anybody's interested. Let's see. Hey Mariah, uh -huh. would you recommend Botanigar? I have a, I was talking to a grower who's growing hydroponically uh -huh. and he has them above the water line too. Uh, so just a spray with Botanigar on those exposed roots? Yeah, the WP. Yeah, yeah. And hypoaspis. Yeah. 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 And if he wants to play around with, I think that since pyrethrin is labeled for aphids, he could do that, but I don't know. Yeah. And root aphid is, is actually the rice root aphid. 
So it occurs in rice. Would you, would you find that in uh, rice straw? If you would like more food rice straw? Could be, yeah. So it's Raphalocyphum rufi abdominalis, and we got that ID from the Department of Agriculture, too. But it's good to know, hey, what is this pest? You know, and it is, it occurs in rice. But grasses in general, it's kind of a broad spectrum one, too. It goes any can kind of live multiple hosts, I should say. And then regalia. How many of you guys are using regalia? You guys, what are you using it for? Uh, you know, prevention, fortress. Are you applying on the surface of the leaf? Or yeah, are you? Oh, we've heard it works well for um, uh, root rot. So, if you're in the water or in like fertilization. So, regalia was originally manufactured for powdery mildew prevention in vineyards on the surface of the leaf. What they found over time is it actually works better as a root trench. Mm -hmm. Even for powdery mildew? Yeah. Well, no, not powdery mildew, mm -hmm. but because it's systemic acquired resistance, so basically the plant is thinking, oh, something's going on, I might be getting sick, so it boosts their immune system. Yeah. So more as a, a pre yeah. preventative yeah. rather than like, okay, it's there straight on the leaf? Yeah, so like you can do weekly root drenches if you is want to. Is it compatible with like compost teas and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, on this table, I should have companion. Yeah. Is it? No. Excuse me. Bacillus can, can you um, initiate something like insect grass for the uh, for that type of response? The chitinase? Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's for. I don't. I'm, I'm not. Chitinase is something I, I still need to kind of study up on a little bit more. With the regalia, how far into the flower can you use it? Oh, you can do it up to harvest because you're doing root drenches, so you're okay. If you want to. When would you start the root crunch? Then? Yeah. Huh? When, when would you start the root crunch? Uh, you vegetative. Okay. And some people, I don't know if this is true or not, but they, some people say that it increases anthocyanins, the colors. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, something with purple hair might become more purple. Let me know if you actually see that too. <laughs> huh? It's on the roses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Powdery mildew, though, is not a systemic pathogen. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote an article with the title, Powdery Mildew is not a systemic pathogen. It is always occurs only in one cell of the plant. So when you're managing powdery mildew, you are managing everything on the surface of the leaf. It doesn't matter which active ingredient you're using. At this time, we don't have a systemic fungicide for powdery mildew. For example, stepping back a little bit, vineyards, they use uh, strobilarin, a fungicide that in the horticulture world is called pageant. And what that does is it goes inside the plant and then wards off fungal spores. But there's some impacts on human health, so I'm glad we don't have systemic fungicides. It's a great opportunity to manage manage powdery mildew holistically. And that's by two steps. You eradicate, you kill the fungal spores, or you prevent the fungal spores from reestablishing. So, and I have a, it's kind of, it's a longer topic. We could talk about powdery mildew for an hour, frankly. But, yeah, it's exciting, right? Yeah. But people have been able to clean up their facilities. And really, it's, a lot of it is, is a stable hydrogen peroxide to kill the spores, mm -hmm. potassium bicarbonate to change the surface of the leaf, and then when the when the powdery mildew is gone, you move towards the effective biofungicides, which is Bacillus subtilis, actinovate to some extent, Streptomyces lidicus, but I think it's important to get multiple. Same thing with compost tea. You know, you could add Bacillus subtilis to compost tea too. So what do you think about the um, OG BioWar? This drench pack and the foiler? Yeah, I think that's a bacillus, isn't it? I think one of the actives is bacillus. So, yeah. I just, Evergreen in general just sells EPA registers, just the way we roll, you know. But I, I think what's important is 
choosing something that works well. And if it works, then good, you know? It's the bio pet biofungicide that's working for you. Um, I have a question about brain mold. Um, we're outdoors and it's really rough brain October and I see a lot of people uh, burning all their mold and all their plant material that's covered in mold. Oh, botrytis? Yeah, botrytis. Um, is that a, what about like composting it? If it's in a properly composted pile, would that kill it? Or is, is this fungus spore just out there and you're know, trying to prevent it? Well, the thing about botrytis is that it is ever present. It, high temperatures and high relative humidity is what causes it to bloom. What it's in the air all the time. It is always there. <clears throat> yeah. And in nurseries, you know, you yeah. use systemic fungicides again. One thing that I, I we work together on, a couple growers <coughs> work together on, is well-timed biofungicides before the flowers close. So when your flowers are nice and open, what happens is the, the, the tritis gets trapped in the center of the flower. The flower closes, right? You, and then the temperatures and relative humidity goes up. You get this bloom of botrytis you can't do anything about in a greenhouse environment if you don't have all the other bells and whistles to maintain your environment. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about botrytis in the springtime yeah. so that you have it. And then the selection of early, if you can, get it figured out in terms of which strains are more likely to mature early. Mm -hmm. But is that the strain people want? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But so it's about timing mm -hmm. and, and getting some, some uh, biofungicides out before the flowers close. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the biofungicides? Um, again, it's bacillus subtilis. Cease. Yeah. Cease. Yeah. yeah. How do you spell that? Uh, cease, like cease and desist, C E A S E. Yeah. And companion, which is on the shelf here, too. Springtime, you're still in the bedroom fire. Yeah. All right. And you said when the fires are still open, so that the oxalates get more dense, that, uh, is it a bacteria? It's a, full, it's a mold. It's, it's a fungal mold. pathogen. Yeah. It's inside those, those flowers. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and that's kind of a vineyard trick. What they what they do is they do their botrytis spray, sprays before bunch closure, which is before the, they tighten up, the fruit tightens up. Oh yeah, I wanted to mention the reason why we make the decisions we make with the approved list. This is the thing about pet health risk is toxicity times exposure. So when they're looking at whether or not something is whether or not it should be used on humans, it is. How bad is it? And if somebody is exposed to it, how much are they going to be impacted? How poorly? Uh, how, you know, long term, short term? For example, was that Spinozid? Spinozid was taken off the approved list. And people weren't happy about it, but it's because when you smoke it and you get it in your lungs, it's bacterial spores, it screw up your lungs. So that's why Spinozid, as well as it is an organic, you got to look at. Pyrolysis, what happens when, when, you, when it is high temperatures, when it's combust? And that's why, like, for example, Colorado made the decisions they made based strictly on pyrolysis. pyrolysis. So, but if you guys have questions about products, and you know, you're welcome to reach out to me. Sometimes things aren't on the list because of label language, so that's the tough part. It has to say greenhouse and other crops. So something could be well suited for an application, but they say the label language isn't broad enough. So if it's not on that bag that's around by the OTA, you're saying that you can still use it at your own risk? Well, I can't. As a licensed pesticide consultant, yeah. say yes. Okay. <laughs> But there's so many tools. We've got so many tools to work with here, though, at the same time. You know, and I think mostly, to be successful, you've got to use a lot of different ones. And I think the beneficial insects, going back to, to um, insect problems, are an important part of your program, even if it's just the hypos. Are you going to be willing to stick around for a little bit after this talk is done? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, you guys, it's getting close to two, and so why don't we uh, close for the day? Make sure you fill out one of these so we can offer you a super prize.
and uh, let us know what it is you want to hear and different speakers you want us to try to bring you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.